Good morning, Waterville, UMC. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Pastor Teresa Wenrink, and I welcome you with the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor just real quick. We're not doing the um, all over. Just say good morning. You'll need to pay um, uh, a lot of attention to your bulletin this week because we're having some technical difficulties. So a lot of the um, the announcements were not on the screen this morning, which also means you have to pay really close attention to me today because our scriptures are not going to be up there either, okay? And I tell you to use the Bible uh, that we have in the back, but it's not the same version. So I will try and speak them slowly and give you reference So if you have a pen or a pencil, you might want to write them down for you to reference later, okay? So with that said, um, we're going to go, because today is um, World Communion Sunday. That's why I'm wearing this garb that I am. This comes from my friends in Salvador in uh, South America. And so we have all different kinds of uh, scarves and bread and everything representing all of that around the world. And so today we're going to have two um, stations to come up and receive communion. Or if you have the vial, you can do either way. If you grabbed a vial and you said, oh, I want to come up, that's okay also. Just place that in the cup, the styrofoam cups that you'll see in your row. And if you use the vial, um, please take the empty vial also and put those in those styrofoam cups that are in your row. Okay? Let's start open um, with prayer. Most gracious, glorious, and wonderful God, we just praise you and thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. Oh, the joy that we will um, be able to share, have, and spread this day. And so God, as we begin a new series, we ask for your love and you ask for your um, guidance and your direction in all that we do. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this day and we are here to worship. So let's begin with our opening Um, prayer. You will see that in your bulletin, okay? And is that on the screen? Oh, it's on the screen also, okay. All right, on this World Communion Sunday, give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. Give us a mind to accept and celebrate our differences. Give Give us a heart big enough to love your children everywhere. We thank you for setting a table with space enough for all of us. Amen. Around the world, people gather to break bread and pour wine. We gather with them in hearts and minds. Around the world, the broken body is made whole. As part of that body, we join in its unity. Around the world, the banquet of God is prepared for the table. We who share in the banquet come eagerly to be fed. Amen. Let us stand and let us prepare to sing our opening um, song. Thank 
you. Please be seated. Come on up, guys. All right, there you go. Now, they're not going to be on this. Oh, maybe they are going to be on the screen. I don't know what you tell me, what, what, what is going to happen and what's not going to happen. So everybody wave on the screen to everyone. Wave to everybody. You see it? You see yourself on the screen? That's awesome. Come on up, guys. Thanks for bringing your friend, Wyatt. That's awesome. Good to see you all this morning. Question for you. What do you like to eat? Cheeseburgers, uh, ketchup and mustard, or just cheese? Ketchup, all right. What else? What do you like to eat? Noodles. Noodle. Oh, noodles are my favorite, too. How about you? Bread? Oh, he does. Well, you should have told me that before today, and we would have had his bread for communion. That would have been great. How about you? Cornbread. Oh, wow. Does he make good cornbread, too? Somebody over here. What? Pizza. How many people like pizza? Yeah. We should have had pizza communion Sunday. All right. What do you like to celebrate? Wow. That's cool. I like to celebrate my birthday, too. I'm still 29. Did you know that? I just celebrate anniversaries. You're four? Oh, I just celebrate anniversaries of my 29th birthday anymore. I stopped at 29. What do you like to celebrate? New Year's? Oh, probably because you like the poppers and the noise things, right? Oh, you get to stay up till 12 or 12.01. I love that. What about you guys? What do you guys like to celebrate? Christmas is a good, fun time, right? Well, you know what today is? What's today? Today is the first day of October. October? October. Yeah, it's close. It's the second, but it's close. <laughs> World Communion Sunday. What does that mean to you guys? Anybody have any idea? That means all around the entire world, people are celebrating Holy Communion today. We call it a sacrament. Some people, like us, we celebrate it once a month. Some people celebrate it once a year. And others maybe only celebrate it um, once a month or, um, or once every week or once every Three months, once every decade. One, some maybe even once every decade, <laughs> once every century. or maybe once, well, probably not once every century, but you know what, as long, yeah, that, yeah, they celebrate it, but today we're all coming around the table to celebrate what Jesus did for us. Do you think that we could pray for some different countries? Can you guys name a country? Hmm? Ukraine. Texas is a good country. <laughs> South Asia. Anybody else have a country? Yes. China. This shirt, like I told you, came from South America. And I've been in Cambodia and Mexico and Israel and Jordan. All those are my friends. What else? South Korea. Chile? Ohio's another good one. All right, can we pray? All right. Lord God. All right, you guys are, are, are sleeping today. You need to repeat after me. Lord God. All right, you guys are sleeping today. You need to help repeat after me, okay? All right, Lord God. We praise you. We thank you. For all the friends and all the people who are coming to table today to celebrate you, may we come together in peace and in grace. God, 
thank you for sending your son so that we can remember his sacrifice to set us free. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Great, guys. Great job, guys. You can now go to Children's Church or you can go back to your seats.
I think I'm just going to sit and let them do the rest of the service. That was absolutely awesome. Thank you for praising God the way you guys do. Aren't they wonderful? That's wonderful. <clears throat> We're going to enter into our time of prayer. Um, do we have any other prayer requests that I missed? Okay. Um, we're not going to have the prayer request on screen. The other one. Oh, okay. Now that's, we're working now? Just that part. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> God knows. God knows, right? All right. Well, you'll see um, on the screen, those are continued prayer requests. And so let us be in this time of prayer that we can lift um, up our concerns to God. So let us be in prayer. For, um, from Squire Young and for all the people in, um, in Florida. The devastation of uh, Hurricane Ian. Lord God, we just... Um, we pray for those um, who have lost their homes, their businesses, their vacation spots. Their world has been turned upside down. And Lord, in the midst of that, we remember that you have asked us to pray in all circumstances. Not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. And so God, may you continue to pour out your grace and your mercy and your love and your providence for these people. And may in the midst of all of that, they find a glimpse of joy that they can celebrate. Maybe it's a hug from a neighbor or someone um, that they find out is okay. Whatever it may be, Lord, we know that you have all of that in your hands. Lord, for John Nicholson and uh, for his continual healing with back issues. And God, we just also pray for him uh, to be able to allow others to help him in his time of that he's harvesting his crops. God, give him the strength that he needs and give Anna the strength that she also needs in her continual healing. Um, and Lord, we know that this is harvest time and the farmers are preparing to go into the field. And so God, may you grant them patience as they um, prepare their hearts to harvest. But Lord, also, as we begin to see the tractors and the equipment on the road, Lord, may we have patience to uh, pause and, and pray for them before we immediately hurry around them. Lord, for those suffering in any way, in any uh, thing emotionally, spiritually, physically, Lord, for those who have long-term diseases, give them comfort and peace. For those who are dealing with addictions, Lord, give them all that they need. Lord, let us be a beacon of light to them. May we find those opportunities to share um, your grace and love to them. And Lord, for um, most importantly, for those who don't know Jesus. Whew. Lord, what they're missing. And so, Lord, work in us, in and through us, to be able to spread your word, to spread the gospel, to introduce them to Christ without even having to say Christ. Lord, help us to be the essence of Jesus. Let us be his hands and feet. And so, God, for all these prayers and for all those in which uh, we hold dear to our heart, we know that you hear us, and we know that you're faithful. And so, God, we thank you for the answered and the unanswered prayers. For, Lord, we know that you know. You know that you know that you know. And we trust in that. And so now, together, let us say the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And Lord, we uh, now raise up all that you give us, all that you do for us. God, you have blessed us abundantly, and Lord, we praise you for being able to bless others, to further your kingdom by our ties, time, and um, talents. And so let us stand. And let us sing and praise God through our doxology. And please remain standing as we, uh, as we um, say our scripture together today from Philippians 1, 3 through 6. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Watching the nightly news Don't seem to find the rhythm Just wanna sing the blues Feels like a song that never Stops Feels like it's never gonna Gotta get that fire fire Back in my bones Before my heart Heart turns into stone So somebody please Pass the megaphone I shout it on the count of three Joy, joy, joy down in my heart, down in my heart to 
different without uh, being able to see uh, a video with it, but didn't that make you just want to get up and joy, 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 joy down in my heart? Where? <laughs> oh, good. You guys still remember the, uh, the classic hymn. And so uh, I'm excited because uh, joy is the theme for our new series. We are talking about the book of Philippians, and it is known as the book of of joy, the book of thanksgiving. And so today we're going to talk about prayer and how those first several verses really speak about how Paul had uh, really embraced prayer. So let's pray. Most gracious, most glorious, and most wonderful God, we indeed come to you today with joy and praise to rejoice and to give you thanks in all that we have and all that we do. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open our entire self to receive you today in a new and mighty way. Lord, we know that you have great plans for us. And so with all the things in our heart, we give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord, change us, mold us, and shape us into who you want us to be. We love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you'll notice that uh, part of our our, um, uh, um, our altar today is all about World Communion Sunday. And the other half is about this thing that we're calling joy in the journey. I want to invite you, and these are some of the things that uh, bring me joy um, in, in, on my journeys, on the things that I've done. I just want to let you, to remind you that yesterday I drove my bike here. I Just to tell you, I drove my bike here, and I'm like, Man, I must be really out of shape. This is really hard. I was just like, what is going on? Here I look down, my tires are flat. It really helps when you have air in your tires. Um, and so I will bring my portable, um, my air compressor, and I will be pumping those up before I go back to take it back home. Thank God I only live right down the road. So anyway, but you know, I thought it would be fun if there's certain things on your journey in life that bring you joy, bring them in. Let's, let's, let's build this scene together. So if you have certain things that uh, bring you joy, if you, you never know, there might be a kayak that shows up in um, here. Um, we're not going to flood the sanctuary, so uh, just be, know that we won't be doing that. But, you know, if that brings you joy, bring it in. All right, we want to be able to do this together. I um, wanted to share with you one of uh, the stories uh, in my journey that sometimes things don't go as planned. And so... Um, my ex-husband and I were on a cruise, and of course, there's always a night in which it's really special, and you're supposed to dress up and get your best grub on and all of that, and I had brought this brand new, beautiful black dress. I was so excited, and then I looked in my closet, and I'm like, I don't have any shoes to go with it. Oh, I'll run and go get something real quick, so I got something. <sighs> I was so excited to found the deal today. My shoes were four dollars, and so I was just like, I threw them in the uh, in the suitcase, and I um, was getting ready for the big gala, and I put them on, and they're two right shoes. <laughs> that sure was a bargain. So I'm like. You know, put my tennis shoes on, and I go down to the store thinking they'll have you know size 11 shoes. Oh, they did. 
with five inch spike heels, okay, that would make me 6'5", I was just like, nope, I'm going down with both right shoes. And so I'm standing there and you get the good old picture and I'm standing there and I'm smiling with my husband and, and do you have two right shoes on? I'm like, yep. <laughs> and he, why do you have two right shoes on, the photographer says, and I'm just like, because that's what the sale was and that's what I bought. <laughs> So you just never know what's going to happen on our journey, but there was at least, we were at least able to laugh about it. It's probably one of the only pictures that I've kept with me and my ex-husband, just because it's so funny, because you can clearly say, I mean, they were sandals, so you know how shoes go like this? Well, they both went like this, you know? And so my toes are hanging out there. It was, it was just a great, great, great thing. So it's a memory that I'll never forget. But you know, our Christian life is a journey. It's a journey in which we really don't know where we're going. Isn't that good news? But it's true. We live in this, I got to be in control. I got to have a plan and I got to stick to it kind of world. And what does God do? He continually surprises us. Now, how many of you are those serious vacation planners? You know who I'm talking about. The ones you have to be somewhere at a certain time. Don't nudge your sister. I saw you. All right. And some place, and you have to, and, and you are just like completely, everything is in order on vacation. And it has to be that way in order to be a success. Come on, show me your hands. All right, come on, Nona. Come on. You're all right. You're all right. You could say that, right? How many of you are fly by the seat of your pants kind of people? You know what it used to drive my family crazy? What are we doing today? I don't know. We're just going to go out. We're just going to go out and we're going to do something. And so, you know, but, and some of us are both. Some of us like to be able to plan and some of us like to just fly by the seat of our pants. But the reality is most of the time in this journey about life, um, we discover that we've never been that way before. It's long and it takes endurance and we have to trust our guide. I remember when I was in Israel, they'd be like, okay, we're going to go to and go to a certain place. And in order to get there, you were like, you know, are you sure we're going to the right place um, on these big giant buses that you're just like, if they capture. We were on our way to Egypt and the um, bus sh um, um, breaks down. Well, in Egypt, you have to report when you leave somewhere and when you plan on getting there. So this is in like 11 o'clock at night. And they're just like, we have to get this together before they come and they will uh, wonder where we're at. So they're um, diligently working on the engine. And the minute we got, it was like we had one minute left before we had to go before they were going to come and bring people. It's pretty serious over there in Egypt the way that you have to travel because uh, if I had my, um, my big huge lens out, uh, they would have taken it. That's how um, serious they are. The same way down in, in um, um, Mexico. And there's certain places where you cannot just be taking pictures. They just are very strict on what they do. Anyway, um, there are uh, scary moments that we have along the way. Moments in which we really don't know what's around the next bend. And frankly, we um, can't even see the next bend. But God has called us to a journey. This is a good way to describe this book of Philippians. And like a lot of the Bible, God has called us to two journeys. An internal journey of holiness, of growth, and sanctification. Of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our actions, in the way that we live life to be conformed to the image more and more day by day to that of the image of Christ. And then um, externally, that the word of the gospel might make its progress around the world. Apostle Paul describes it as running a race. He counted his life worth nothing to him if only he might finish the race and complete the task that um, the Lord Jesus had given him. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. The book of Philippians is known, as I'd mentioned, 
as the letter of joy. So in all that we are facing in this world today, let us journey with joy. Philippians gives us everything we need to rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what is going on. What is interesting about this book is that Paul wrote this while he was in prison. The book of joy written in prison. Uh, You know, not only was he in prison, but his life laid in the balance. His release was not guaranteed. Paul was staring death right in the face. Everything about Paul's life in that moment screamed pity party, not joy. Yet what we uh, do find is Paul doing um, while, yet what we find Paul doing while chained to a Roman guard is rejoicing. And it should be noted that this joyful disposition was not unique for um, Paul. See, Paul's life was one of joy, day in and day out. This was uh, despite his trials and tribulations. Paul had joy in the midst of imprisonment, in the midst of beatings and lashings and stonings and being shipwrecked and adrift at sea, constant danger, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst and cold and exposure to the elements. That makes you just want to go, woohoo, right? I don't know about you, but I would have been a little bit bitter. But not Paul. His joy was not dependent on his circumstances. His disposition was not a prisoner of two coincidence. So the question says, so what makes Paul's source, what is Paul's source of his joy? And it was indeed his relationship with Jesus Christ. No matter what took place in Paul's life, It could never separate him from the love of God found in Jesus Christ. The love of Christ was better than wealth, food, comfort, freedom, and life itself. Jesus was the greatest treasure in his life, and everything was nothing compared to knowing him. uh, Let's admit it. We're all struggling, right? In one way or another. The circumstances in your life might be um, maybe a weight and you feel like you're about to break. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your marriage. Your singleness. Your retirement. Your health. Or just the monotony of life. Whatever it is, your heart craves joy. And you have searched the world for something to satisfy it, satisfy its hunger. Yet time and time again, you come up empty. You ever wonder why? Because the joy of your heart is not found in this world. It is found in something out of this world. We need to uh, stop focusing on our circumstances and start focusing more on Jesus. So Apostle Paul was in prison again. He was in prison for preaching the gospel. He was in chains. And the Philippian church that he had planted was a church that was precious to him, near and dear to his heart. He had great uh, memories of his experiences in Philippi and um, of the significant events that happened there. He loved these people dearly, and they in return loved him. They had heard that once again he was in prison and uh, might actually die, that he was facing the possibility of leaving this world and that he may be executed for his faith in Christ. Now, the church in Philippi was planted when Paul received an image in a dream in Acts 16. Now, if you want to have some further reading, Go ahead and read Acts 16. It's a great story. But here's how it goes in verses Acts 16, verses 9 and 10. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there, pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once 
having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Paul immediately started making plans. He was one of those guys. Got to be, you know, I got to put the things in order. Paul and Luke began preaching in Philippi. And the church is established, but not just established, it's, it, it's established with these amazing supernatural events. Now, this is what occurs in Acts 16. The Lord led Paul, okay, and his people to go to the river to pray. Going down to the river to pray. Isn't there a song like that? Yeah. You're supposed to sing that when that happens. <laughs> but when he reached the river, river, he found these women there. And they began, um, and he began to preach the gospel to them. And there was one woman named Lydia who responded to the preaching and was baptized. Then Paul and Silas are put in jail again, and at midnight they begin to sing praises to God. And the Lord then sends this earthquake to break open the jail. The jailer was about to kill himself because the prisoners were escaping, but Paul uses this um, as an opportunity to preach the gospel to him and eventually to the jailer's family. Isn't that cool? I mean, that is supernatural stuff. And then this demon-possessed girl who was hopeless, but because Paul was willing to preach to, in Philippi, the girl was set free and the de- uh, of the demon and was converted. That just happens in Acts 16. That's just how it started in Philippi. Now, eventually Paul found it necessary, though, to leave Philippi, but Luke stayed and helped the church. The church at Philippi became a great joy to Paul, and church was um, always willing to be a source of strength and financial support in the work that Paul had done. Philippians is considered one of history's greatest thank you letters. Okay, so now I just set the whole background for you. That's, I know, you're all excited that I had to be able to set, take that long to set the background. But that's important on what is happening in this city. So now um, let's look at Philippians 1, 3 through 6 again. I'm going to read that to you. I, right? It's not up there. Okay, all right. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray... I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am (laughs) certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Paul gives us this glimpse into his prayer life. These verses record how he prayed for the Philippians. Paul is an example of how, no matter the situation, we can pray with joy and praise. Now, we just had a major hurricane go through Florida. Maybe this is how some of the things that he gives us and teaches us in these verses, we can pray for those in Fort Myers. So, this is how he lived out his prayer life. Joy is built on continued prayer. Let me repeat verses 3 and 4. Every time I think of you, he says, and whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. I can't help but think, Paul sure must have prayed a lot for these uh, Philippians. But this is not new. Paul was consistent in his continual prayer. If you remember, Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament and the epistles. So, So listen to this, how he addressed so many of the other letters, okay? From Romans, this is what he writes. This is verse one, verses eight through 10. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. Then 
to the people of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.4. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gift he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. And then to Ephesians. Um, the Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 says this again. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. And then to Colossia, in Colossians 1, 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And then finally, in 1 Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Now, isn't it amazing how Paul um, would write to all of these different people in all of these different churches to tell all of them that he is always praying for them. Now, either he's a big fat liar, or he really did spend almost all of his time praying for those he had ministered the gospel to. Pray, uh, Paul must have spent more time praying than you or I can even imagine. May Paul be that example of, uh, for us in this continual prayer. Now next, joy is built on continual thanksgiving. If you remember, verse 3 was this, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Paul's very specific here, right? He says, every time. Turn to your neighbor and say, every time. He gives thanks to God. This is one of the keys to having um, contentment and joy. But how could this be? How could he rejoice considering the situations that he was in? How could he do this joy thing? He was in jail writing this epistle. And on his first trip, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. Yet from that gospel in Philippi, Paul and Silas sang for joy to the Lord. And now here Paul was in prison again, writing to the Philippians and taking out Take, um, talking about the joy that he had. Boom! Man, that's just like mind-blowing. I think I may have been a little bit bitter. Being thrown in prison for preaching the gospel? I would hope you guys would write. <laughs> and later in Philippians, in 4.13, he says, Paul says this, he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. How many of you have said that? You know, um, I love, loved, I should say loved, to climb mountains. Now I love to climb smaller mountains. They're called hills, okay? Um, I'm not in the shape that I was in years ago. Uh, so at those times when I was panting, and actually I was praying it when I was driving over here on my bike, uh, and trying my best, I would recite that. I would say, I can do all things through Christ. And it would help me get up that hill or the mountain. But Paul here, he is writing about something much more difficult than getting up a hill. He is talking about how God gives him the ability to be content in any circumstances, which is a greater, which is a greater miracle for all of us. See, Paul was content because he walked with God on a daily basis. From Psalm 104, David says this, he says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. We should begin our prayers with thanksgiving. Begin our days with thanksgiving. Continually give thanks like Paul did. This attitude of gratitude is key in living a joyful journey, a joyful life. When we are not grateful, it is really ruining our outlook in life and our relationship with each other. We are always wanting things to be different, always wanting more, always griping about, griping about what we don't have instead of giving gratitude for what we do have. All right, let me ask, 
And you can be honest, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but have you ever said any of these phrases? Why can't I have this? My wife never does, you fill in the blank. I just wish my husband were more like so-and-so. My friends just don't get it. I wish my job were more this way. Gratitude makes a huge difference in our lives. Instead, in all circumstances, find what you can be grateful for and thank God for it. It will do amazing things for your outlook and help you be content and find joy in that situation. Number three, joy is built on being gospel-focused. He says in verses 4 and 5, Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. If you are a Christian, you really do have a real reason to be thankful no matter what happens to you here on earth because you have the gospel. Let me ask, do you think that the Philippians had financial issues at the time? I would say yes. Do you think the Philippians had a need for physical healing among them? Sure they did. Could there be a genuine need for physical and material help? Yeah. But it's interesting how Paul doesn't make that the focus of his prayer. Paul is saying that the gospel is the most important thing there is. Yeah, he could have um, thanked them for their health, for their success, for their nice home. But he's saying, I pray with joy because you have been my partners in spreading Jesus, in spreading the gospel of the Lord. Now, this is not just positive thinking. Because as Christians, we really do have something to give thanks for in every situation in our lives. We really do um, have a reason for joy. Let me give you, here, let me, let me put it this way. All right. I want you to imagine with me. All right. It's like um, um, a person who has just been told that they have won a million dollars. Right? But you have to go to the courthouse to get it. All right? And you have to endure an uncomfortable taxi ride through a bad traffic in a big city with heavy pollution and a slimy-looking, obnoxious cabbie to get there to get your inheritance. But all that doesn't matter, does it? Does it matter how bad the ride is? Does it matter how bad the traffic is? Or how bad the pollution smells? Or how obnoxious that cabbie really is? You can put up with anything along the way. You can look past all that and rejoice and give thanks, right? Those minor inconveniences don't matter because you have so much waiting for you. You got a million bucks waiting for you. As Christians, remember, we have eternal blessings that are far greater than any temporary inconveniences we might experience. It's better than a million bucks. It's Jesus. It's everlasting life that we have. Finally, joy is built on expectancy. Verse 6, let me repeat it again. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I don't know about you, but I sure am glad that that promise and that provision that God is continually working on me. Guys, this is a statement of God's sanctification of his sanctifying grace, of how much he loves you right where you are, but he has absolutely no intention of ever leaving you there. 
He is constantly going to guide you and direct you and bring you into a deeper relationship with him, with the world and with all of those around you. Now, um, do you ever feel like you're making progress in your spiritual life or that you feel like you're a little bit lagging? Let me tell you something. I'm just going to put it real bluntly. He ain't done with you yet. Turn to your neighbor and say, he ain't done with you yet. <laughs> remember. Remember his promise and his provision. Now, I know that sometimes when you hear a message like this on prayer, you, our automatic response is of guilt because we um, know that we aren't spending as much time as we ought to in prayer. Okay, and just remember, when I'm preaching to you, I'm also preaching to myself. However, I think the question isn't so much about how much time, but rather the question is, what have we made our prayer out to be? Is it just a checklist for us to check? Say, yep, I prayed today. Is this just something that we do to make us feel good? Have we made our prayers out to be only about ourselves? When we pray, do we say things like, you know, God, I could usually real help on this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need that. Are you praying for the people in Florida? Are you praying for your neighbor? Are you praying for those who don't know Jesus Christ? Are you lifting that up? Are you praying for, for your children, for your grandchildren? Have we not come to God in prayer because we are prideful? Instead, let's turn to our Savior and repent. Repent of our sins. And know that our prayers are being heard and accepted by God. If we are true and sincere, he forgives us. He forgives those around us. Let's trust in Jesus Christ who has now removed this legalistic, this ritualistic understanding of prayer and given us this privilege of knowing and talking and sharing our lives together with him. Let's ask God to transform our prayer lives to be joy-filled. May our joy built on continual prayer, continual thanksgiving, gospel-focused, and all that God has in store. Let's pray. Most holy and gracious God, we praise you. We thank you. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for wanting to be in a relationship with us, an intimate, passionate, life-changing relationship with us. God, thank you for your son who you loved and sent to this world for us because of you loved us so much. Paul speaks of this love that he has for the churches. And God, your love outdoes that every time. And God, we never really can wrap our complete mind around of that great love. But God, thank you for going before us. Thank you for walking with us. And God, thank you for always having our back. God, we love you so much. We just praise you for this day and this opportunity to become together, to come together as the body of Christ to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And God, as our children come in to share at table, God, may we just be so joyful because at one time we were those children And somebody came around us and 
it showed us the joy of the Lord. So God, as we prepare our hearts to go to the table, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, as I mentioned, today is World Communion Sunday. And we are going to come together with all the people around the world to praise God. It's a special invitation to come. Everyone to come. Everyone to come and to receive God's love and God's blessing. And to remember what he did for us how he continually walks with us and how he continues to already know our future. He's got great plans, right? And so he does. That's right. He has great plans. All right, maybe I'll ask that again and see if anybody else responds. This. And God has great plans for us, right? Yeah. Absolutely. What beauty. What innocence. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that. What great joy. And so we remember. We remember on that night that Jesus gathered his friends, his misfit friends, and he took an ordinary element that they were used to, not this fluffy stuff, but of bread. And he took it and he raised it to the Father. And he said, thank you. And then he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he broke it with joy. Because he knew what was about to happen. He knew that he got to fulfill something that was going to be joyful the rest of the life, even though he had to go through pain. And he said, this is my body given for you. And every time that you eat of it, remember me. And as the uh, meal continued, he took the cup. And he once again, he raised it to the Father and he gave thanks. And he blessed it and then he passed it to each and every one of his friends. And he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and you and you and you and you. And every time that you drink of it, remember me. Let's pray. Most gracious and glorious God, pour out your Holy Spirit onto this beautiful body of Christ. For all those who are here, all those who have joined online, all of those around the world, Lord God, at this moment and in this day that are gathering at table to become one with you, Lord, one with you, one with each other, and one in unity to tell everyone that we run into that Jesus is Lord. Holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit onto these gifts of bread and juice, that they become symbols of your body and blood poured out for us for the forgiveness of all sin. And so God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you so much thanks, so much joy that you would love us so much that you would send your Son to die for us so that when we come to the table, we remember that great sacrifice we love you, Lord, and we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. For those who are coming, that are um, the community distributors, if you could please come forward. We'll be serving by intinction but also through um, the vials that you have. If you have a vial, please grab that, and that's the way you choose to receive communion today. That's the body of Christ. 
broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Hold on a second, stay right here. You guys come right here. We're going to be on that side. table is set. Come. We start in the back and we come forward. Come and be at table together. Praise be to God. Return around to the side. So please Most holy God. What an honor. What a privilege. What a blessing. What joy. 
come. I remember what you had done for us. Everlasting, eternal joy that only us as Christians can do and experience. Lord, work in us to spread the gospel. Let us not be prisoners to fear of what others may believe or may think of us for spreading the gospel. Give us confidence, Lord God, to tell others about you so that we may at one day feast at your heavenly banquet together, together with all those around the world. God, we praise you not only this day but every day for, for who you are and for what you have done. We love you so much, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for being able to participate in this meal that heals. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. May you be blessed this week. And as you pray, pray as Paul did. Pray with joy and thanksgiving and continually and with great energy. And in all circumstances, may you know how loved you are. So go in peace. Go love on your neighbor. And go be the church. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week, guys.